So uh, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, welcome back to the University of Chicago, those of you who haven't been on campus recently. Um, since this is, I have some, uh, some material prepared to give you some, um, some overview of my research on urban poverty, my thoughts about urban policy. But I think this is going to be most interesting if this is uh, an interactive hour and five minutes, uh, however much time we have. So since it's the University of Chicago, I encourage you to say whatever you want, whenever you want, in whatever tone of voice you would like. <laughs> um, so the, the, thing that, um, the thing that I'm really interested in, in talking about is um, two of what seem to me to be the really key striking features of urban life in Chicago and in so many American cities, which is um, one of those features is the uh, massive amounts of economic and racial segregation that we see across communities, neighborhoods within the city. And the related feature of urban life that is so striking is the unbelievable concentration of social problems across neighborhoods as well that winds up mapping very closely onto racial and economic segregation. So I think that this is a picture of an abandoned building somewhere on Cottage Grove that, uh, as all of you know, this is the street that divides Hyde Park, the neighborhood of Hyde Park from the neighborhood of uh, Washington Park. Um, you can go to the uh, City of Chicago's uh, Board of Public Health and download information by community areas in the City of Chicago. And this is what you would see if you compared some basic social indicators in Hyde Park with some basic social indicators for the neighborhood that is literally directly adjacent to Hyde Park, right across Cottage Grove. So in many ways, crossing Cottage Grove in terms of social indicators is in some sense like entering an entirely different world just by crossing the street. If you look at the poverty rate in Hyde Park, for instance, something like 17% of people in Hyde Park are poor compared to about 52% of the people who live in Washington Park. Most of the rest of the people who live in Washington Park are probably not much above the poverty line. Um, something uh, a little over a third of residents in Hyde Park are African American. The fraction of Washington Park that's black is 98%. Uh, if you look at the high school graduation rate for Kenwood Academy, which is one of the high schools that, uh, that serves the Hyde Park area, the graduation rate is about 76%, which is very far from great. If you, uh, my daughter takes swim lessons at Diet High School, which is on the northern part of Washington Park. The high school graduation rate, the overall average high school graduation rate at Diet High School, which serves Washington Park, is about 36%. Two out of every three kids who enter Diet High School are going to drop out. And those are the kids that make it through ninth grade. Right? Now, it is true that Illinois state law says that you're not allowed to drop out before 16 or 17. But the city of Chicago basically has no capacity to enforce compulsory schooling laws. And a bunch of kids leave school even before they even make it to ninth grade. Right? The final thing that I think is really so striking about, um, about Hyde Park and uh, uh, Washington Park are the differences in crime rates. If you go to the city of London, the homicide rate in London is about one per 100,000 people. The homicide rate here in Hyde Park is about three per 100,000. So we think of Hyde Park as being a very, very safe place by Chicago standards. Um, if London had a homicide rate like Hyde Park's, people would be freaking out. OK? So that's, I think, a useful benchmark. If you go to Washington Park, the homicide rate in the entire community is 68 per 100,000. So you might think, I don't know what 68 per 100,000 means. Here's one way to think about this. If you go to the vital statistics data at CDC and you look at leading causes of death for people ages 15 to 24, what you will see is that homicide is the, not just the leading cause of death for blacks 15 to 24 in the United States, but that homicides kill more 15 to 24-year-old blacks in the United States than the nine other leading causes of death combined. Okay, here's another way to think about the, about the problem. Um, we can, one of the measures that we have for, uh, for mortality and health burdens is to think about years of potential life lost, right? So this is the difference between the expected population life expectancy and the actual age of death for people. So this accounts for the fact that different causes of death have different age distributions of when people die from them, okay? 
Heart disease in the US as a whole is by far the leading killer. Far more people die from heart disease than, uh, than other causes of death. For blacks, about because homicide is concentrated so disproportionately among young people, for blacks in the United States, about as many years of potential life lost uh, come from homicide as from heart disease. Okay, that's what 68 per 100,000 in a Washington Park neighborhood that's 98% African American means, right? And again, these are two neighborhoods that are literally right across the street, right? You could throw a baseball from President Obama's private residence to Washington Park. Not me, but somebody who had a good throwing arm <laughs> could do something like that. Now, what's also interesting about the, the stylized facts that I just described is that they are not new. So um, one of the things that's very cool for me to be here at the University of, of Chicago is um, this is where people basically first started thinking about these sorts of patterns and what might explain them. So this is basically where urban sociology was invented back in the 1920s by people in the sociology department who first started to gather the sort of aggregate data showing that when you looked across neighborhoods in Chicago at that time, there were huge differences in all sorts of problems, alcoholism, homicide, suicide, so on and so on, right? And that got the sociologists here at Chicago uh, interested in the possibility. We know that poor people, we know that disadvantaged people in the United States are at elevated risk for all sorts of social problems, right? Um, the, the sociologists here at Chicago began to worry that above and beyond the effect of your own family background, your own socioeconomic status, above and beyond the effects of that might be um, you might be doubly disadvantaged if you are poor and also living in a neighborhood where lots of other people are poor and disadvantaged on top of that, right? This is to say people got very worried that neighborhood environments themselves might causally contribute to the prevalence of the social problems that we see across places in, in Chicago. In particular, one of the things that the early sociologists were really most interested in was um, the, the possibility that uh, when you concentrate together many disadvantaged people, and at that time, the, uh, immigration was a big contributor to the disadvantage that we saw across neighborhoods. When you concentrate disadvantaged people together in neighborhoods with high rates of mobility, that makes it very, very difficult to neighbors to organize themselves and socially control the, uh, the neighborhood environment. So here's just a little quote by, um, I love that there was a sociology professor looking at urban problems, and his name was Professor Walter C. Reckless. Um, so here's just one quote to give you uh, a flavor. The creation of immoral flats on the suburban fringe of the city were a uh, very inviting field of commercialized vice. So it's fascinating how interested and worried people were in the 20s about things like gambling and drinking and prostitution, right? A very inviting field of uh, commercialized vice, not merely because of the lively, lively and mobile character of these regions, but also because of the anonymity and individuation produced by the highly mechanized living conditions, right? So what you can see here is a concern not just about what the, the families themselves, the people living in the neighborhoods, their own individual risk, but it's about no mobility in the neighborhood, the churning of other people in the neighborhood, right? It's about the anonymity of people in the community. These are arguments about the causal influence of the social environment in affecting people's life chances and outcomes. Okay. Um, I, I'm new to Chicago. I got here newish. I got here in the summer of, of, of 07, but I uh, have become completely fascinated by the city of Chicago and its history. So I just love, I, I could literally spend five hours showing you all pictures of the city of Chicago, so I had to uh, restrain myself. I'll just show you a couple. This gives you a flavor for what Chicago looked like when the, the Chicago School of Sociology first started to think about these problems. So this is a picture you can see. These are some tenements, abandoned buildings. You can sort of get some flavor for, um, for the quality of life in Chicago in the 1940s in the slum areas. These are some more pictures that give you a flavor of what the Chicago slums were like during the early days. Um, so this is the reason that I think it's interesting to uh, keep the, the uh, the conditions of the slums in mind in the early part of the 20th century is as a way to understand at least part of the motivation for what came next. Okay, So anybody who has read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle knows that the living conditions in these slum neighborhoods were dramatically worse than these pictures can possibly begin to convey. Right, And so 
the dismal conditions in the slums were at least one of the contributing factors for the development of Chicago's system of public housing and public housing all across the, um, all across the country. Does anyone know who that moderately dour man in the middle is? <laughs> That is, that, is, that is De Mayer, indeed, right? So uh, this is Mayor Daley Sr. Uh, looking, at, um, looking at a uh, very compelling, not to scale model of what public housing in Chicago would look like, right? And so this is the, I guess it was, I'm not an architectural guy, but I guess it was Carbusier, is that the way to pronounce it? The French architect who was arguing about the tower in the park, right? And so you can see this has a very sort of appealing, the model here has a very sort of appealing in, in principle kind of tower in the park flavor to it, right? Does anyone know what this is? What building this is? This is the Robert Taylor Homes, although you could be forgiven if you had guessed instead that this is a supermax prison. <laughs> Anyone who's interested in, in the development of urban poverty in Chicago, in fact, anybody, everybody here, I have no financial connection with his author, so this is a, a totally objective recommendation, but Bradford Hunt at Roosevelt University has written the most wonderful book called Blueprint for Disaster. I would strongly encourage everyone to read. It was... It's published by the University of Chicago Press, Blueprint for Disaster. It is absolutely gripping reading, heartbreaking, but completely fascinating. So this is basically the re I'm sorry? Is that his name? Uh, Bradford Hunt, H-U-N-T, Blueprint for Disaster. Uh, it, it's a wonderful book. So he talks about the development of public housing in Chicago. This is another sort of picture. Um, these are, the, uh, these are the open way breezeways. So there are no indoor tunnels. There are open air breezeways. There are intended to be like elevated parks in the, um, in the public housing buildings. Um, this is a picture taken on one of the open air breezeways just to give you a flavor for uh, what these were like. So let me just make, um, let me just pause and make three observations about this picture that I think are, uh, are interesting. So, the first thing that is very interesting about this picture is that it is not an accident that the kids are African American. Okay, if you uh, walk through the public, if you took a census of the public housing uh, projects like Robert Taylor during their heyday, so if we were meeting like 15 years ago, what you would see is that almost all of these housing projects on the south and west sides were almost entirely African American. The second thing that is really interesting about this picture is, I don't know if you can see along the, uh, along the wall there, um, that is that where that uh, piece of plywood is, boarded, uh, is nailed up, that is supposed to be a window for the apartment. Now, uh, I came here, my friend Phil Cook and I came here in Chicago in the 1990s and went around to some public housing projects with Sidir Venkatesh. Some of you might know some of his uh, ethnography. And so Sidir took us into some of the public, uh, some of the Robert Taylor homes. I've been in a public housing in Baltimore as well and other cities. And I would say at least 80% of the, the public housing apartments that I visited have boarded up windows. And you wonder why that is. The inside of these housing apartment, public housing apartments are unbelievably grim, right? They're just exposed cinder block, usually covered with roaches crawling over the wall. They smell terrible. They're just grim in every possible way. Why would you board that up? to prevent any sort, and then they're just illuminated by a single naked uh, bulb hanging from the ceiling usually, you would think, why would you take out the natural light? Can anyone guess why the windows are boarded up in these, in these projects? Well, for safety, so people don't break in and kill you. That's exactly right, for safety, for safety. Um, so think about what it's like to live in these housing projects, right, where you are afraid to go outside you're living in this unbelievably grim unit, and crime is one of the most salient characteristics of your existence in these places. And it's such a big concern that you would nail up, um, uh, you'd put plywood over the window to prevent any sort of natural light from coming in. The final thing that I would just say is you can see for the breezeway, this is sort of the outside right here, you can see there's floor to ceiling chain link fence. Can anyone guess why we have floor to ceiling chain link fence? So um, th uh, there's another great book called Our America, which was narrated by two kids, I think, on the west side of Chicago who are in a building where a kid was thrown out, uh, like a six-year-old kid was thrown out a window for refusing to shoplift candy for two other slightly older kids. He was thrown out a window, not off a causeway. These chain-link fence predated 
this poor six-year-old kid being thrown out of a public housing window? Can anyone guess? Is it serving suicide? You know, what's really interesting about this, despite the massive amount of segregation and all the social problems afflicting the African-American community in the United States, the suicide rate for, uh, for blacks on average is lower than what you see for whites. So the main motivation was not suicide. Does anyone want to make a guess? Sniper? Now, it was from people, the only public space was right out in front of the building, and it was from people throwing stuff out over the, so the people running CHA at the time made what struck them as a rational decision to put a chain link fence from floor to ceiling over the breezeways. It has the effect of adding to this sort of uh, super max aesthetic that you see in these public housing projects, right? Okay. Um, so, so this is the development of, uh, of, public health, of, uh, of racial segregation in Chicago. It started with Im the immigrant inflows from the very beginning, continued with private market discrimination during the, uh, the Great Migration. Um, in the late 1980s, William Julius Wilson, who was on the University of Chicago sociology faculty at the time, offered another explanation for the hyper-segregation that we uh, saw at that point in the city of Chicago, which is, um, many of you might be familiar with his book, The Truly Disadvantaged, which argued that um, in part, in part, that the fair housing laws that were enacted in the United States in the 1960s had the byproduct of enabling middle-class African-American families who'd been able to, who had been forced to live in racially segregated neighborhoods next to low-income African-Americans could now move out into other places, which wound up leading to highly concentrated poverty neighborhoods in the inner city of Chicago. And then Wilson elaborated on um, some of the earlier sociological arguments from the first Chicago school about the different ways in which the neighborhood social environment might contribute to, uh, to, dis uh, to disadvantage. So, uh, Wilson was really worried about peer-to-peer -peer influences, right? I knew that this, I was going to talk to a bunch of Chicago alumni, so I wear a tie, right? If this were instead a fish concert, I'd be dressed very differently. Well, sadly for me, probably not all that differently, but you get the basic idea. <laughs> um, and the other thing that he was really interested in was the, um, the importance of seeing people in your neighborhood who had graduated from high school and, and are, were working in the formal labor market as a signal to everyone in the community, but particularly the kids, about the value of engaging with mainstream social institutions. All right. So this is just a picture of what Wilson was worried about. From 1970 to 1990, you can see the number of census tracts. So a census tract has about 6,000 people in it. The number of census tracts in the United States that had a poverty rate of 40% or more basically doubled. There was a big decline from 1990 to 2000 during the economic boom but it's still the case that as of the 2000 decennial census, there were about 7 million Americans living in census tracts with poverty rates of about 40% or higher. That, so this remains a massive problem that we have, a, a massive feature of urban life in the United States. Okay, now let me just pause for a second and say the, the thing that has really been of, uh, of great interest from the very beginning of, uh, of social science on this question is the degree to which the neighborhood environment itself causally affects people's behavior. Now this turns out to be a very, very difficult um, social science inference question for the following reason. Imagine that you see a low-income, single African-American mom living on the south side of Chicago in Washington Park, and you see a low-income, single African-American mom living in Hyde Park. The two households themselves are observationally equivalent. They have the same number of kids in the same ages. They have the same income levels. And what you will see on average is that even accounting for their own family background characteristics, the kids living in the more racially and economically integrated neighborhoods like Hyde Park will have better schooling and other outcomes than the kids who are living in the more segregated neighborhoods like Washington Park. Now, the inferential challenge is, um, the way that I've constructed the example, we are implicitly statistically adjusting for the observable things about the families themselves, right? The inferential challenge is, um, are the differences in outcomes for the kids in Hyde Park and Washington Park due to the neighborhood environments themselves or to whatever other very hard to measure 
features about the families might contribute to one low-income African-American mom somehow being able to get her family into Hyde Park and another low-income African-American mom instead winding up living in Washington Park. Right? That is, people basically have some degree of choice, some degree of choice over where they live. And as a result of that, it's very, very difficult to look at differences in outcomes for people across neighborhoods and be sure that what we're seeing is, difference, is the causal effect of the neighborhood environment itself. Now, this is a very, very important question for urban policy because starting with public housing but not ending with public housing, there's a huge set of, of, of public policies that influence the concentration of poverty that we see in the United States. Okay? So, um, now, yeah. Do uh, examples of Hispanic American um, cluster groups that you show exist as well? Or, and I'm not asking about white Americans, I understand that, but yep. at least Hispanic Americans were, who probably started at an economically disadvantaged beginning. Yeah, you know, what's really interesting about his modern Hispanic um, immigration is there's a lot of, I mean, if you've been to Pilsen, you know that there's a lot of residential segregation of Hispanics as well as blacks. What's interesting is that if you look at, um, if you look at like the homicide rate in the vital statistics data, the homicide rate for Hispanics is not anywhere near what you see for blacks. And if you look at overall crime rates, for instance, for recent immigrants to the United States, they're actually lower than what you see for native born uh, for native-born Americans. So there's something about the immigration experience, at least in modern America, that changes the way that some of these, you know, these um, uh, social risk factors, you might call them, influence their life outcomes, which is really interesting and I think nobody actually really understands very well right now. So, um, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's one of the lead, one of the leading hypotheses. Uh, one of the leading hypotheses is that there are these big differences in family structure between um, between Latinos and African Americans in the United States. And so, one of the hypotheses is that the family structure might act as sort of a protective buffer against some of the adverse influences of these other of these other individual or neighborhood risk factors. Okay. Um, so. Uh, the, the research that I'm going to spend just a couple minutes telling you about really began with a lawsuit filed in 1968 by a woman named Dorothy Gattrell. Many Those of you from Chicago might be familiar with the Gattrell lawsuit. Um, so, so Dorothy Gattrell was an African-American public housing resident in Chicago who looked around and said it's not fair that blacks getting, public, that getting housing, means-tested housing assistance in the United States live in these unbelievably racially segregated housing projects while poor whites who get housing help live in much more integrated areas. And so she filed a lawsuit against CHA, the Chicago Housing Authority, and HUD for racial discrimination. She won in 1976. The Supreme Court um, ordered CHA and HUD to start moving a bunch of African-American families out of public housing into, rac into racially integrated neighborhoods with housing vouchers. That is basically they would get housing vouchers to move into private market housing. Um, and about 7,000 uh, families were ordered to relocate. So in the 1980s, my friend Jim Rosenbaum, who's a sociologist at Northwestern, had the idea um, so some of the families who relocated during Gautreaux moved to other parts of the city, and some of the families in Gautreaux relocated to the suburbs, places like Oak Park and Evanston and so on. Um, and the suburban movers in Gautreaux wound up experiencing even more dramatic changes in neighborhood environments than the Gautreaux people who moved to other parts of Chicago. So Jim had the very intriguing idea of going out and surveying the families who moved to the city versus moved to the suburbs in the Gautreaux program. And what he found were really dramatic differences in life outcomes. So this is sort of like a natural experiment. You're taking a set of families and you're putting some in the suburbs and some into the city. And what we saw was that the kids who got moved, the parents who got moved to the suburbs had much better labor market outcomes than the parents who got moved to the city. And the kids who got moved to the suburbs had much better schooling outcomes, much better schooling outcomes than the kids who moved to the city. The uh, so, um, so this is really the key to the whole Gautreaux study. So what Jim Rosenbaum claimed is 
that families were assigned to a wait list and they wound up taking the first voucher. The, the, so what happened under Gautreau is that some nonprofit uh, organization helped families find apartments and would go to the first fam the, the family at the top of the wait program wait list and offer them a key to an apartment, saying, we found you a unit that will take a housing voucher. Here's the key. Would you like to take it? What Jim claims is that almost all of the families accepted the, the key to whatever unit happened to be offered to them when they got to the top of the list. But families could refuse the unit that got offered to them and uh, see if they got something that they liked better. So it's not exactly like a randomized clinical trial. And in fact, when you look at the baseline characteristics of the city and the suburban movers, they look systematically different. right? And so the concern with Gattrell has been that the families who wind up in the suburbs might be systematically different than the families who wind up in the city. And so when we see the differences in outcomes, we're not sure if it's really due to the suburban environments or to something about um, the families who wind up in the suburbs. Nevertheless, the, um, the Gattrell findings have been profoundly influential in housing policy circles in the United States. Um, uh, as a result of Gautreau, Jack Kemp, who was uh, the HUD secretary under the first President Bush, decided that HUD should actually do a real, real live randomized experiment, like a clinical trial to test the efficacy of Lipitor or some other medical device, to see whether neighborhoods were as beneficial for families as Gautreau suggested. Um, uh, Kemp really liked this idea because Kemp really was enamored of the idea of using the private housing market to help poor families rather than government-run public housing. 1992, Bill Clinton gets elected. The Clinton people at HUD also like the idea, but for completely different reasons. They like it because it has the potential to deconcentrate poverty. Right. So the same intervention, uh, very, uh, a very deep appeal uh, across party lines, but for different reasons. Okay. So this basically has been what, I, uh, what I've been working on for the last 15 years. So you might think, how can someone who looks like they're 18 have been working on a, on a single research project for 15? And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say that I was a child genius and, and, just, <laughs> and just hope that you don't push me too hard on that, uh, on that claim. Um, so I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about MTO, and then I'll, I'll say a little bit about what I think the lessons are of MTO, and then I'll, uh, and I'll stop, and I'd be eager to hear your questions. But I really do also hope that you will ask me questions about MTO and my interpretation of the findings as we, uh, uh, as we go. So HUD authorized MTO, uh, uh, HUD authorized MTO with HUD's, uh, Congress authorized MTO with HUD support in the early 1990s, starting in 1994, through MTO, they, started, they enrolled about 4,600 families living in some of the worst public housing projects in the country, in five cities, of which Chicago was one of the cities. Um, the Chicago site was Robert Taylor Homes, to give you a flavor for what the baseline conditions were for these families. Um, in Chicago, almost all the families were African American. In the five sites in MTO altogether, it was about two-thirds black and one-third Hispanic. Um, one of the interesting things about MTO is, uh, you know, the education people looked at MTO and said families are going to want this program to get better schools. Labor economists looked at this and said, no, no, they're going to want to join MTO to get access to better jobs. Health researchers said, no, 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 families are going to sign up for MTO because they're going to want access to better health care services and so on. The main reason, 75% of the families who signed up for MTO said the first or second most important reason they signed up was safety was crime. And this goes back to the boarded up windows that we saw before in Robert Taylor homes, right? Um, so what happens under MTO is that families then basically, they sign up for the program, and then they're randomly assigned, where some of the families get offered a housing voucher to relocate to a low poverty tract, that is a census tract with a poverty rate less than 10%. The baseline poverty rate, the average poverty rate at baseline for these families was about 60%. And now they're moving to census tracts with poverty rates of under 10% if they, if they move through the program, okay? That is a huge change. And because families were randomly assigned, this is just like any sort of clinical trial that you would see in medicine. So finally, we have the chance to get gold standard evidence about the causal effects of neighborhood environments and the life outcomes for these families. 
You referred to Section 8 vouchers? Basically, so, yeah, it's, it's no longer called the Section 8 voucher. It's like the Housing Choice Voucher Program. But at the time of MTO, they were called Section 8 vouchers. And the, the Section 8 is like the part of the housing law that, yeah. You said families were randomly assigned, but you also said they had the chance to decide that were not Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an important point. So about one quarter of the eligible families in these housing projects signed up for the program. So the families who sign up are clearly likely to be systematically different from the families who don't sign up. But within the quarter of families who signed up, within that set of families who signed up, those families are randomly assigned. Okay. So what MTO is able to do is give us a gold standard unbiased estimate for the causal effects of changing neighborhood environments and changing housing units on the outcomes for the type of family who would volunteer for this sort of voucher program, which is a very policy relevant thing to know because in the real world, our housing mobility programs are almost always voluntary, right? So we want to know the effects of helping families move on the families who are of the sort who would be inclined to volunteer to do this. Yeah, there was a hand in the back too. Uh, I was wondering, as this is such a long-term study and neighborhoods undergo gentrification or changes yep. themselves, how is that controlled? to know that the control families didn't also undergo yep. changes in the neighborhood. That's a, great, that's a great question. So, so here's what the MTO experiment tells us. What MTO tells us is, what is the effect of assisting families to move out of public housing relative to a counterfactual condition of whatever would have happened to those public housing, housing families otherwise? So the counterfactual condition, that is the control condition that we're looking at, is not immobility. It is not being stuck in public housing forever. And as you know, if you've driven down 55th Street and made a right on State Street anytime recently, um, it is, I think that I, I was just over there at a CPS meeting the other day. They call it now Robert Taylor Park, which is really quite remarkable. So it is just like a two mile, I don't know how long it is. It's like a mile or two mile long grass field. There's nothing there anymore. So the control families were moving over time in part because CHA and HUD were blowing up their housing projects. And the treatment group families, they had to use the voucher to stay in a low poverty neighborhood for a year. But after that, they were allowed to use the voucher to move again if they wanted. So one of the empirical questions that MTO would test is the degree to which families would stick in these new low poverty neighborhoods, right? So, so I think implicit in your question is the question of does neighborhood assignment to get a voucher cause any durable changes in neighborhood environments for families over some extended period of time? This is what the neighborhoods look like as of four to seven years out after random assignment. So the poverty rate, you can see the poverty rate for the control group is about, so this bar right here is the average poverty rate for people in the control group. And it's about 40%. So it's come down over time in part for the, thing, for the reason that you said. That there are changes going on in the control group. The control group is moving a little bit on their own for a variety of reasons. Um, the poverty rate for the MTO movers is about 20% on average. right? So, and part of what's going on is that uh, they're moving into low poverty neighborhoods that are getting a little bit worse over time. So they're low poverty when they move in, but they're, they're reverse gentrifying, if I can use that as a, uh, if I can invent that term. Um, almost no change in share minority, huge reductions in crime victimization. About 20% of families had had someone in the home victimized in the six months of the control families. 20% of the control group families had had someone victimized in the six months before they were interviewed. Imagine you live in a world in which one of five households that you know are victims of a crime over a six month period. That is not a very long exposure period. That victimization rate is about cut in half, nearly cut in half for the families who move through MTO. And you also see really big improvements in, in neighborhood satisfaction. Okay, so this is exactly the sort of, by the world of social policy, this is a massive change in families conditions, right? This is exactly the sort of change that sociologists since the 1920s had predicted would lead to dramatic changes in all sorts of, should lead to dramatic changes in all sorts of life outcomes for families. And the Gatro quasi-experimental study also had suggested that these types of moves should lead to very large changes in life outcomes for families. 
the one, um, one of these stats I would uh, question a bit would be the legalization one. Yep. I'm assuming that um, to be eligible for uh, getting a voucher, you would have to have some level of, of not being um, either indicted or uh, taken it for a crime or some sort of thing. I believe it. Right, right. In practice, they don't check that very much. Yeah, but yeah, know. but remember, this is victimization. Oh, um, well, I guess what I'm wondering about is folks that are, uh, maybe that's in my head, that folks that are involved in crimes are usually also more correlated in terms of being victims of crimes. Yeah. So that seems a little bit less than I would have imagined. The other one, I think, might be dramatic. Yeah, the, um, what we're, we're in, the, in the field now doing the long term study, and we're gathering mortality records. Um, which include homicide victimization. So that, that is as objective a measure of crime in involvement as you can imagine. So one thing you might be worried about is like, um, is like uh, mis systematic misreporting, right? Or if you equalize what I just said, it might not be as, it might be very similar. And I, I just don't know. Yeah, but yeah. It just seems a little bit less dramatic than I would have anticipated. Than you would have anticipated. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Very sure I'm sorry? So that's the combination of black and Hispanic in the census tract. And what you can see is um, there are big changes in neighborhood poverty rates, not very large changes in neighborhood racial, uh, racial segregation. So basically, families at MTO move from very high poverty, uh, mostly minority neighborhoods, to much lower poverty, mostly minority neighborhoods. Okay, That's the way to think about what the MTO treatment dose is. Um, this has caused a bit of uh, a bit of concern in sociology since these results were released. So, um, when you look at adult employment outcomes, almost any measure of adult labor. So, this sociology literature for nearly a hundred years has predicted that neighborhood environments themselves help explain why there's such high rates of unemployment in inner city areas. And in MTO, when you randomly assign families to move into much different neighborhood environments, you see almost no change on any measure of labor market environment, uh, labor market involvement, social program participation, and so on and so on and so on. The place where you did see changes in, um, uh, in adult outcomes, um, not self-reported health status, but we see pretty sizable changes in obese. Notice one other, so the control means are at least as interesting as the treatment effect here. Notice this is having a BMI, this is a body mass index of 30 or over. So this is the, the Surgeon General standard for obesity. Notice what the height of this control group bar is. So what that's telling you is that almost half of the control group moms, they're about 40 years old on average. About half of the moms are obese, right? That's that's unbelievable. Um, and it reduces the likelihood of obesity by about 10 percentage points, from 47% to 37%. And sizable changes in maternal depression. So we see health effects from these dramatic neighborhood moves, but absolutely nothing on employment outcomes, which has really been such a, a big component of social policy in this area. Um, this is for the kids now. We got their juvenile arrest records, and you can see Again, these are the MTO movers. These are the control groups. You see really big declines in the likelihood of being arrested for violent crimes. And um, some evidence of an increase in property crime arrest for the kids in the, in, who moved through MTO, which could be if, you've ever, if you ever drove down State Street when the Robert Taylor homes were there, you would look around and think there really is not all that much to steal here, right? Or different policing. So if policing is better in low poverty neighborhoods. Or, or the, the arrest in the suburbs. I'm sorry? The arrest in the suburbs. Yeah, yeah. No, so that's what, that's what I'm getting at. If the, if the uh, likelihood of arrest conditional on crime is higher in low poverty areas, then we're going to overstate any adverse effect of MTO on criminal behavior, and we're going to understate any declines. So that's the way to think about that. And the, one of the main reasons HUD signed MTO into law was they really wanted to improve the schooling outcomes for these kids. And these are impacts expressed as um, uh, standard deviation units, where the population is centered at zero, the population mean is zero. And these are shares of a standard deviation, plus or minus. No statistically significant changes in achievement test scores for any of the kids in MTO. Um, 
through, through four to seven years after baseline, even for the kids who are of preschool age at baseline. Okay? So let me, let me pause and say, does anyone have any questions uh, before I sort of give you my three minutes of what I think the MTO findings mean? Does anyone have any questions about MTO? Yep. Yeah, I was wondering that four to seven year uh, um, group that you're using, what four to seven years was it? Is it late 90s or? Yeah, so the, um, the data collection happened, so families were randomly assigned from 94 to 98, and then we did the data collection through 2002. So it was in 2002 when I guess the economy was just starting to slow down. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have any ideas as to um, what drove the reduction in obesity among MTO families other than maybe um, better eating as a result of getting out of the food business? Yeah, what's interesting about this is um, uh, there are a couple interesting things about, about that question. So um, what we see is um, improvements in, in diet for the moms. The moms are more likely to eat fruits and vegetables and the moms are more likely to, ex to exercise. You don't see any evidence of either of those things for the kids. So one of the interesting things to think about, I don't know how to think about this food desert stuff after looking at the MTO results. Um, one way to think about this is that if there really were very important food deserts, you would have seen changes in the diet for the kids as well as changes for the diet in the parents unless the influences of the food deserts are limited to adults for some reason. You know, it could be that the schools are doing a decent job of providing kids with more nutritional food at breakfast time and lunch time. Um, I don't know. I've heard some pretty grim things about the CPS school lunches. But in principle, that could be better than what the kids would get, would get otherwise, and that might attenuate some of the adverse influences of the food deserts. But what is also interesting about the health changes that we see for the adults in MTO is um, there are no differences between the treatment and the control groups in MTO in self-reports about whether you have access to a regular doctor for well care checkups, about whether someone in your family got sick and you couldn't go get medical care when you needed it. So you know, the, in addition to food deserts, there's been a, a huge amount of concern about inadequate medical care facilities in inner city neighborhoods. And we see absolutely no difference in access to health care facilities, in, at least in the MTO data, which I think is pretty striking. Any other, uh, any other questions about MTO itself? Yes. Um, do you talk a little bit more detail about where they're moving? Like, is it mostly urban areas or other yeah, it, uh, it varies a lot across the five MTO cities. So, um, you know, I, 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 should, I wish that I would have done this. It, what's really, really interesting about, so, so the most striking thing about the MTO mobility patterns is to see the picture. And of course, I, I didn't think to give you the, the, the picture, the map of where they go. So if you look at like Chicago, what you see is the control group families, even though there is demolition of the housing project, the control group families wind up clustering around the baseline neighborhoods. The, um, and then the, um, uh, the treatment group families wind up clustering right, it's sort of like a flower, where the treatment group families wind up clustering right around the control group areas, which I think is really interesting and, uh, and telling in many ways, right? In some sense, it's not, so the geographic distance I think what, what we see in the MTO mobility data is that on average, families who got offered these low poverty vouchers moved to the geographically most proximate neighborhood that met the voucher low poverty threshold, right? Which is not surprising if you've ever had a job offer to move to a different place. One of the key things that you wrestle with is the disruption of your social network. We have all our friends here. All my relatives were on the East Coast. Moving to Chicago was a huge deal for us, right? And that was the hardest call for us. You can imagine if you grew up in the Robert Taylor homes, your parents grew up in the Robert Taylor homes, all of your relatives are there, all of your friends, you've been going to church or mosque or synagogue or whatever there for your entire 35, 40 years of your life. 
just picking up and moving out to the suburbs is a very, very difficult thing. So suburban moves in big cities like Chicago were relatively rare. In smaller cities like Baltimore, you saw a lot more <coughs> residential mobility, in part because there's much more limited availability of low poverty census tracts in the city of Baltimore itself. If that Would you please repeat the questions that we can't hear them? Oh, sorry. So the, uh, the question was, uh, do the MTO families move out, to the, uh, move out to the suburbs a lot? And the answer is uh, not as much as you would have thought. Not as much as you would have thought. Yes? Doesn't that, some of that, isn't some of that because people in those areas are not all transsexual? Because they're not transsexual. Well, they're not accepting the Yeah, so, you know, that's another, um, there, are, there are three constraints on uh, three constraints on what you can do when you're offered a housing voucher, even setting aside the low poverty constraint in MTO. So one constraint is that the housing voucher, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but in effect, the housing voucher basically has a rent cap. That is, I mean, you're allowed to go a little bit over the rent cap, but effectively has a rent cap that is pegged to something like the 40th or 45th percentile of the local area rent distribution. So what that means is a huge part of the housing stock in your area is already taken off the table because you can't afford it with the voucher. The second thing that's going on is the thing that you just mentioned, which is that landlords definitely do not treat housing vouchers and cash as equivalent. One of the, one of the reasons is who the families are with the vouchers, but the other reason is that there's also a bunch of things that the landlords have to do to comply with the voucher program requirements. Like the units have to get inspected beforehand and so on. And the third thing that goes on with the voucher is the housing agencies don't want to have the vouchers sit idle for a really, really long time while families are searching, if that makes sense. So what they do is they give you a limited time window to search for a new unit. And if you can't find a unit within like 90 to 180 days, there's a little bit of flexibility across cities. If you can't find a unit within the time period, you lose the voucher and it goes to the next family on the list so they can search. But what that means is you have a bunch of low-income families who are working sometimes multiple jobs to make ends meet. They, none of these families have cars, right? Uh, many of these, most of these families have just one adult, so you've got kids that you've got to worry about childcare for. So the housing search process itself is very complicated on top of it. Now, all of these families, I didn't mention this, but all of these families did get housing search assistance from a local nonprofit, which helps overcome at least part of the issue that you're, uh, that you're getting at, but not fully addresses it. And as a result of that, what you could see is um, only about 50 to 60% of the families offered a housing voucher relocate through the MTO program, consistent with these barriers that you're mentioning. Yes, uh, another problem was that the not-for-profit would not recognize that groups of people wanted to live together, because there were a group of people from Cabrini Green who brought a lawsuit so that well, they could live together because they were each other's support. Yeah, yeah. Oh, do I have that? Uh, no, that's on my, we should take the show on the road. That's on my next slide. You know, one, one of the things, <laughs> but then I would have to give you a cut of the huge royalty check that they're giving me for this. Um, the, uh, I think that's actually a absolutely right. So MTO was a little bit weird because when they, when they implemented the program, what they didn't want what they intentionally didn't want in MTO was for the reconcentration of poor families in low poverty areas. They thought would cause all sorts of problems. The other thing that, like setting aside MTO now, the other thing that's really striking about these housing, so housing policy in America is in many ways completely un unbelievable and profoundly illogical in the following sense. So we think that housing problems are so severe in the United States for poor families that we spend $40 billion a year on it. And yet, what we wind up doing is giving huge subsidies to only 28% of the people who are income eligible. So it's so important we'll spend a bunch of money on it, and yet 72% of income eligible families in the United States get absolutely no means-tested housing assistance at all. The families who get it get a subsidy that's worth like $8,000 a year, which is huge as a proportion of their baseline incomes but then 72% of the families get zero. Like it is a, it is an all, in my view, it's an indefensible way to allocate scarce housing policy dollars 
to give a bunch of families like a lottery windfall and then give 72% of the families nothing. Anyway, the, but the, the main point of that is that all of these housing programs then have really big wait lists, which makes it very, very difficult to do exactly the thing that you, in a world in which everybody got a housing voucher, then it's easy for me and my neighbor and my other neighbor who are our support networks to move together. In a world in which, you know, in Chicago, they opened the voucher program wait list in 1997. They had something like three or 4,000 vouchers to give out. They had 82,000 eligible families apply. The families got randomly assigned to the voucher program wait list, one through 82,000. Now imagine that me and my neighbor and my other neighbor apply for a voucher. I'm gonna be number 6,001. My other neighbor is going to be 30,006, and then my third neighbor is going to be like 80,000, right? There's no way that we're going to be able to relocate. So one of the things that I think, in a world in which we're worried that social networks might create path dependence in residential locations, we should be thinking about exact, and I think it would be important to at least explore the possibility of doing the sort of thing that you mentioned. Experiment with the idea of what I call a buddy voucher, where instead of allocating vouchers to people, allocate voucher, a collection of vouchers to groups of people, which I think would be really, really interesting. Yes? Have you done any analysis on of the families that did move, the ones that maybe randomly were buddy vouchers? Because it just happened to be that two people were divided. Did you see any results? Yeah, we, um, we don't have very good data about the degree to which the families at baseline knew each other, unfortunately. I think that would be something that would be really, really interesting and useful to know more about. Yes. Do you have any data on like other um, residents in the neighborhoods where people moved to like, that were already there? Yeah, that's the other. Um, uh, that is the other. That is probably the the biggest. Uh, I'm. I want to say limitation, but I don't want to say limitation because the impact of MTO moves on on the other people in the low poverty neighborhoods was never something, from the very beginning, they knew MTO would not be informative about that, right? Because families are selecting where they go, and so the places that they go are not a representative sample. There's no randomized experiment in MTO to test the effect of the people in the neighborhoods where the MTO families go. So we have, and so the other tricky part of even just measuring that without a good research design is that HUD really wants to preserve the anonymity of the families at MTO. We don't want nerdy researchers like me knocking on doors saying, tell me how you feel about having this former public housing resident move three doors down from you as part of this really neat HUD randomized experiment called moving to opportunity. Right? That's exactly what HUD didn't want to happen. Um, so we don't know very much about the destination neighborhoods. And I think that's clearly something that we've got to know a lot more about as we think about the, uh, think about sort of mobility programs more generally. Yes, sir. I'm depressed. <laughs> you started out by talking about the studies for 90 years. Yep. It seems like after 90 years, we don't really have a good idea in terms of policy, in terms of what to do. It seems like- Oh, no, I, got, I've got some, I, I have some ideas. Oh, I have some ideas. Goodness. But I think one of the things, that, one of the things that MTO- I'm looking for hope. <laughs> one of the things that MTO tells us, though, is that it is the risk, it, it is the collection of risk factors and the absence of protective factors that the families themselves have that wind up being really important in understanding a lot of the variation across neighborhoods that we see in outcomes, right? Does, if that makes sense, right? So the moms in MTO have low employment rates in their high poverty neighborhoods, not so much because of the neighborhood environments themselves, but because so many of the moms are depressed, they don't have childcare, they don't have uh, uh, any sort of decent schooling history and so on. So it's more about the problems of the moms than about the problems of the neighborhood environments themselves. Do you have enough of a consensus to get a policy, actually policy importance built around it that have an impact on the, you know, on the problem? It seems like, it seems like you, know, you know, the knowledge is, 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 is disputed and political and thought about. How do you make a base problem? How do you, how do you change the numbers in terms of work? Yeah, let me, um, uh, let, let me, let me say two, th I have two slides about what, what, I, would, what I would do on the, um, so um, 
you know, all of my housing economists, tell me if, let me, let me go through my two slides and then tell me if you're more or less depressed, okay? Um, okay, so um, all of my housing economist friends tell me that it is cheaper to provide housing assistance to poor families through housing vouchers than to rely on public housing programs for a variety of reasons, including a bunch of inefficiencies that wind up, wind up developing as part of public housing. So um, now what is relevant to keep it, so that I think changes the way you think about MTO. Setting aside the possibility of adverse effects on the people in the destination neighborhoods, if you're willing to set that aside for the time being, MTO is an intervention that has a zero or even a negative cost, right? Giving public housing families housing vouchers saves the government money. So long as it does not adversely influence the people in the destination neighborhoods, and that's a very important caveat, but so long as it does not disadvantage the people in the destination neighborhoods, um, we should be doing that, right? This is my, based on working on MTO for 15 years, my view is that we should be vouchering out public housing. But you gotta give visit to move, though. Yeah, but even, you know, even if the families, uh, I mean, you see in MTO what the residential uh, uh, outcomes are, there are a bunch of outcome domains that are not changed, but the, the families are happier. Their crime victimization looks like it's down, setting aside this sort of measurement concern. And the health outcomes, at least for the moms, are better. So if you have an intervention that has like a zero cost, and at least some of the outcome domains we care about are affected, we should be doing that. That's my sort of view about this. Are there enough landlords willing to enter the voucher program and rent to these families? Yeah, so uh, if you look at all of the housing vouchers in circulation, all of the housing vouchers that are funded nationwide, about 99% of or the, the utilization rate of funded voucher lines at any point in time is above 99%. There are almost no housing vouchers that go unutilized. And also keep in mind what we've done in our crazy housing policy for the 72% of families who get no housing assistance, we've sent them off into the housing market without any subsidies, right? So the vouchers, we are relying on the, the private housing market, market for 72% of the families without subsidies. Well, many of them are in homeless family support environments. Yeah, um, the, uh, the homelessness rate for, uh, for these sorts of, so, Something like 10% of the families at MTO wind up having a homeless spell. Usually that's being doubled up with other families. But again, if homelessness is the thing that you're worried about, what we should be doing is giving every income eligible family a modest, a minimum subsidy level to ensure that they don't drop into homelessness, rather than spending $8,000 a year on a family to get a public housing unit. That's my sort of view about this. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so one, you know, the normal way that economists think about social policy is we think that there are declining marginal returns to resources, right? So if you take a family that has a $10,000 income and you give them an extra $1,000 of resources, that might have a big effect. If you give Ivanka Trump an extra $1,000 in resources, does everyone know who Ivanka Trump is? She's very rich, that's the key part of the, if you give Ivanka Trump $1,000 of extra resources, it should have no effect. That, so basically the, you know, if, if the Y axis is like kid outcomes and this is family income, the, the marginal return, the, as family income increases, the extra benefit to families of getting extra resources declines. If you believe that's true, then you should be concentrating your money in giving everybody at least a little bit, rather than doing the thing that we do in housing policy right now. Okay, so, yeah. But even if there are diminishing returns on this, isn't there some minimum amount that'll be useful? I mean, if you gave everyone $10, theoretically, that's like the maximum return, but... So is it, is it, necessarily, is it necessarily better to give... Uh, one person $100 or 10 people $10? Let's 
Yeah, so you guys are all, this is so fascinating. You know, what you guys have in mind is a world that looks something like that. Like, there's nothing magical about the poverty line in the United States, right? It's, it was invented by a lady at SSA in the 1960s who said, how much do families spend on food? And we'll multiply that by three. It's not like if you have income $50 below the poverty line, you are in total dire straits, and you cross over the poverty line, and the clouds open up, and the sun shines upon you, and you can buy the house next to President Obama and Kenwood, and so on and so on, right? Um, and I think, you know, the, the social, there's social science research on this, which seems much more consistent with this way the world works than with this way the world works, right? So, okay. Um, so, so we talked about the buddy voucher. Uh, let me now talk about mixed income developments. Um, I think the other sort of policy thing that a lot of people have been interested, there are basically two types of, of ways of dealing with urban poverty. One is that you can move families out, and the other is that you can make the neighborhoods better. And the Harlem Children's Zone is one of the most famous recent examples of what you do to make the neighborhood better. They spend something like $70 million a year on a 10 by 10 square block area in Harlem. Um, they spend about $19,000 per kid for each kid in their charter schools. And for all the other kids in the neighborhood, they spend about $5,000 a year. We are, so the Obama administration has this Promised Neighborhoods initiative, right? They're going to do it for 20 neighborhoods across the whole country. There are six neighborhoods applying just in Chicago alone, right? This is not, it is so expensive, this is not a scalable intervention by any stretch of the imagination. So in the, the four minutes left, let me, let me tell you what my, what my I idea is as a result of working on MTO. I would end means-tested housing programs in the United States. Okay? Um, we spend $40 billion a year right now on these programs. And if you look at the MTO data, so one of the things that we can tease out from the MTO data, and I'm happy to talk about how we do this afterwards if anyone's interested, but looking at the MTO data, so the MTO families change their housing units, they get better housing units in the private housing market, and then they also change their neighborhood environments. All of the evidence from MTO says that changing housing units doesn't matter at all for, all of the, for any of these family outcomes that we care about. The housing unit itself, now being homeless is going to be damaging to families, but short of homelessness, the quality of your housing unit doesn't matter. Uh, given some sort of minimum quality of, of, that they had in the public housing, the neighborhood environments matter a lot, right? Housing policy is not very good at changing neighborhood environments. It's much better at letting families move into better housing units. So we should get rid of it if our goal is to improve the life outcomes of low-income families. As a way to think about what you could do with $40 billion a year, oh, I should, I should have, how many people know what the, I don't think I'm tall enough to do this, how many people know what the annual budget is for Head Start? <laughs> don't, <laughs> it's, it's about $8 billion, is that what you guessed? Eight billion dollars a year on Head Start. If we ended, if we abolished HUD tomorrow, and put forty billion dollars into early childhood education, I have a paper with Bell Sawhill at Brookings that says what could you do with fifty billion dollars a year on early childhood education? We would have a chance of eliminating the black-white test score gap in the United States. Okay. Um, as another way to think about this, MTO has convinced me that one of the most important things that we can do to improve the quality of life of poor families is improve public safety in these communities. Now, it is very difficult to do inner city policing well. There are all sorts of challenges in police community relations, but I, uh, my, my look at the criminology research suggests that every dollar that we put into extra police resources generates from four to eight dollars in benefits to society. I think the US is way under policed right now. We spend about a hundred billion dollars a year on policing. Forty billion dollars would represent a huge proportional change in policing intensity in some of the most dangerous inner city neighborhoods in, uh, in the United States. So for me, in a world in which every level of government is flat broke in the United States right now, right? Now, you know, if I had un a lot more money, would I, would I print an extra $40 billion 
to spend on police and early education, absolutely, in a world in which we're not going to do that and we're flat broke. For me, there's a, uh, it makes a huge amount of sense to think about shifting money from housing programs into education and safety as a budget neutral way to substantially improve the quality of life for poor families in the United States. So let me stop there. We're about uh, out of time.